Good afternoon and welcome to the Asian Development Bank's latest Asian Impact webinar. Uh, our topic today is disaster resilience in Asia and the Pacific. Now, the Asian Development Bank has been working to support its developing member countries to build resilience and preparedness for many years through both financing and knowledge. But of course, the COVID-19 pandemic that has swept the world has refocused minds. Few of us anticipated a disaster so severe, so ubiquitous. So in short, we're facing new challenges in the disaster resilience arena. So what do we need to do to shockproof the region? Well, we have a number of experts to discuss that very issue with us today. So first up, we're going to hear from Yasuyuki Sawada, well known to many of you. He's ADB's chief economist. He's going to talk us through some work that he and his team have been doing to update one of ADB's key recent publications describing Asia's journey to prosperity. We've also got a wonderful trio of experts for you. Very briefly, they are Deborati Guhasupia. Debbie is the director of the Center for Research on the Epidemiology of Disasters at the University of Louvain in Brussels, Belgium. You may well know that she also founded MDAT, which is the International Reference Database on Natural Disasters. We've also got with us today Ilan Noy, professor and the inaugural chair in the Economics of Disasters and Climate Change. He's at the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. And lastly, Charlotte Benson, Charlie to friends and family, which we all are here. She is the principal disaster risk management specialist here at the Asian Development Bank. She's been instrumental in developing ADB's disaster risk management policies and strategies. Now, following Yasu's presentation, we're going to have a question and answer session. Um, here is where you, we really want you to participate. So please write your questions in the Q&A box right at the bottom of the screen. We'll get to as many of them as we can. If you see any questions that you like, click, please, as the video told you earlier, click on the thumbs up to like them. We will deal with and address the most uh, popular questions, those questions most in demand. So all that said, I'm going to hand the virtual microphone to Yasu now. Yasu. Thank you, Karen. Um, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, the webinar today. Um, uh, I'd like to briefly uh, uh, present um, 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 a new publication. Uh, in January 2020, last year, January, uh, ADB published uh, this book, you can see the left, uh, titled Asia's Journey to Prosperity, Policy, Market, and Technology over uh, 50 years. Uh, this um, uh, more than 500 pages long book offers an overview of Asian growth and transformation over the last five uh, decades and discusses the key uh, policy lessons drawn from the uh, uh, regions uh, continued success. Then uh, sudden emergence of coronavirus uh, uh, disease COVID-19 underscore the importance of building register, uh, disaster resilience, a topic of increasing relevance, but uh, uh, not specifically covered as the uh, this uh, Asia's uh, journey to prosperity book. So uh, today, uh, this special supplement we just released uh, this morning systematically address issues that are related to disaster resilience. Also today, uh, we uh, put out uh, presentation slides on uh, 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 for the 15 chapters of Asian Journey to Prosperity book, as well as uh, uh, today's uh, newly released uh, supplement on ADB website. This special supplement we released today updates um, uh, uh, theme chapter part two of Asian Development Outlook 2019, uh, Strengthening Disaster Resilience, and also various ADB studies on the uh, economic impact of COVID-19 assessment, uh, together with the numerous uh, policy reports, briefs, and working papers we produced after the uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Uh, this special supplement uh, report focuses on uh, disaster triggered by natural hazards, including pandemic. Uh, the report is divided into two parts. The first part is devoted to a discussion of disaster in general. Second part uh, delves uh, into how the region is uh, navigating to ill effects of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So briefly, um, uh, let me uh, go through um, uh, uh, the uh, contents of this uh, a special supplement. First, this new report points a uh, rising trend of uh, disaster risk globally and also regionally. Uh, since the uh, uh, 1960s, about a third, one third of all global disasters 
triggered by natural hazards has occurred in developing Asia. Uh, here we uh, listed the high profile disasters in the region, including Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004, cyclone in Bangladesh in year uh, 1991, and cyclone Nar Nargis hitting Myanmar in uh, year 2008. The tremendous cost of disasters to the region we can observe. Between 1960 and 2020, the region accounted for 85% of the number of affected persons globally, 65% of death toll globally, and 27% of damage uh, from the global disaster triggered by natural hazards. Also, we should note that disasters generate long-term impacts and ripple effects. Severe disasters can have more persistent effects and also affect other regions and sectors through supply chain network or other uh, 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 mechanisms. In developing Asia, exposure to disaster risk has risen over the last half century due to growing population and economic growth. Generally speaking, a, dis a disaster occurs when a hazard interacts with an exposed and vulnerable population, causing harm to the people damaging physical assets such as property and infrastructure and with indirect losses from economic activity uh, foregone. In order to tackle increasing disaster risks, approaches to disaster resilience and risk management has evolved through the years. Especially, we can note that from 1994 to 2015, three important global frameworks for disaster risk management were adopted in a global forum held in Japan. In 1994, the very first World Conference on Disaster Risks, uh, risk disaster, uh, uh, the first World Conference on Disaster Reduction uh, adopted the Yokohama strategy for a safer world, which sets out uh, landmark guidelines for disaster prevention, preparedness, and mitigation. The policies and approaches evolved to address an uh, elaborated question, how to broadly integrate disaster and climate resilience with overall development objectives in the last few years. Despite the progress in disaster risk management in Asia, more work needs to be done, especially due to COVID-19 outbreak. So the second part of this uh, newly released report discusses COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic has evolved uh, to become one of the most catastrophic events in history, uh, spreading to every continent in the world. The number of cases continue to rise, both globally and within developing Asia. The pandemic is far from over. Um, the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak affected economy, economies through numerous channels listed here a sharp decline in domestic demand, tourism and uh, business travel due to border closures, export through trade and production linkages. Also, measures to contain COVID-19 has undercut developing Asia's supply side production activities. While there is a general trade-off between health outcome and the economic level, uh, this trade-off is uh, also uh, possibly avoidable. Uh, for the case of uh, Republic Korea's uh, wisely avoided this um, uh, seemingly inevitable uh, trade-off between health and the economy by using, uh, for example, digital uh, technologies. More seriously, COVID-19 crisis is generating long-term effects on vulnerable population, including a micro and small and medium scale enterprises, education and human capital accumulation uh, process, especially for children and women, labor intensive sec service sectors, propagating chronic poverty and creating a possible poverty traps. Informal settlers in urban areas whose numbers increasing uh, uh, every year face this vulnerability. As you can see from this chart, according to ADB estimate, the crisis, COVID crisis reversed years of pro progress towards eliminating poverty in developing Asia. In year 2020, COVID-19 is estimated to add 178 million and 78 million uh, to the poor in developing Asia in terms of uh, 3.2 dollars uh, per day and 1.9 dollars per day international poverty lines uh, respectively. 
In order to counteract the negative, enormous COVID-19 impacts, governments are responding with massive policy packages. Since mid-April 2020, the ADB COVID-19 policy database has been tracking the large-scale policy packages of uh, ADB members. This database contains uh, detailed information on measures the uh, authorities have taken in order to combat COVID-19. Uh, this database covers 68 members of ADB, uh, both developed and uh, developing uh, countries, two institutions, EU, ECB, and nine other economies. Uh, the database represents 92% of global GDP and 80%, 0% of global population. So according to this database, uh, within developing Asia, we can um, um, uh, highlight two uh, 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 characteristics. Number one, Policy packages was more than 3.6 million, uh, 3.6 trillion US dollars, or 15% of regional GDP, have been announced to counteract the effects of COVID-19. Secondly, government health and income support, showing in blue in this chart, account for more than half of the region's policy response. Social protection programs are very important part of these massive uh, packages. Yeah, so this is a, a government uh, responses um, uh, figures. And uh, final uh, slide, I'd like to uh, summarize looking ahead. Um, uh, basically, I listed here six priority areas. Um, and uh, this is um, uh, summarized in the newly published uh, supplement. Number one, uh, shifting support to spending on disaster prevention and preparedness instead of a disaster response. That's a very important uh, priority area. Secondly, careful uh, planning uh, and designing and uh, investing in climate resilient and disaster resilient infrastructure are fundamentally indispensable. Number three, formal insurance mechanisms should be built further in the region. Four, engagement of the community in planning for disaster reduction, response and recovery is really critical. Five, comprehensive planning and strategies for reconstruction rebuilding better or rebuilding smarter should be placed as the core strategy. And finally, but not least, disaster recovery should apply new technology and uh, innovations proactively. So these are the uh, six priority areas uh, looking ahead. So with that, um, I'd like to stop my presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Over to you, Karen. Thanks very much, Yasu. Yes, yeah, sorry, you, you bring up uh, a lot of uh, very, very pertinent issues. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more raised in the Q&A session. Um, while we wait for those to pop in, let me just uh, mention, we did have one question coming in um, related to the presentation. So I just wanted to say that the presentation will be available on the adb.org website, along with the recording of this video. So um, please, you know, you'll find it there. Uh, the team also tells me that they will put it posted in the chat box as well for everybody who's currently on the call. So you should be able to get hold of it very, very quickly. Well, while we wait for some questions to come in, I just wanted to um, ask Ilan, actually. Um, Ilan, I think you've done some work already on the relationship or the, uh, the relative impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic versus other disasters. And have looked a little bit, um, done some research at least, related to the, the economic impact on that. Can I ask you to just speak very briefly to that? Yes, so we've, we've done some work um, looking, um, thank you, first of all, thank you, Karen and Yasu for uh, organizing this, uh, and Joe for organizing this talk. Um, yes, we have, we've done a, um, um, a, a measure, we've con uh, constructed a measure that aims to um, maybe a comprehensive measure of the cost of COVID-19 across countries. And, and the idea is to um, add together the mortality and the morbidity that are associated with the disease with the economic impact of the um, disease and using a metric that we call life years. Um, so basically um, calculate how many life years were lost to people because of mortality, how many were lost because of morbidity, and how many were lost because of the decline in economic activity, because ultimately economic activity is associated with our um, well-being and lost economic activity is something we will need to regain through, um, through effort. Um, so if you look at this measure across countries, and this is in per capita, 
measures, then you see that some countries are obvious, obviously experienced more dire um, consequences from COVID-19 in 2020. I, I emphasize that this is in 2020. And we already know that in 2021, for example, more people have died in 2021 from COVID-19 than in 2020. Um, that's already was true in May. So in the five months of January through May 2021, more people died than, than in all of 2020 from COVID-19. So this is, this is just a snapshot for 2020, but we see some countries that have um, their loss per capita was much higher than others. Um, and in some cases, and in many cases, it's not so much associated with the mortality and the morbidity, which we hear so much about, but it's actually from very, very deep declines in economic activity. So for example, um, tourism dependent countries like the Maldives um, have experienced very, very dramatic declines, even though the uh, COVID-19 itself uh, the pandemic was not such a um, such a deep crisis. Um, same is true actually in India uh, in 2020. Of course, the crisis in India was in the, the health crisis was in 2021, but the economic crisis was already um, there in 2020. When we compare that to the average annual li uh, life years lost from other disasters, we see a very different picture. Um, and here, of course, Asia. So Asia was much more successful with COVID-19 compared to the rest of the world than it is usually with disasters because, uh, well, it's a very disa disaster prone region, right? It's on the uh, Pacific Rim, it's, it's uh, on the um, typhoon belt and so on. So the impacts of disasters in, in Asia is very, um, is very large, but even, even for Asia, when we compare it across, across the regions um, and we compare the cost of COVID-19 in 2020 versus the average annual cost of disasters previously, we see that even in Asia, COVID-19 was much, much more significant of an, um, of an impact. And again, I'm, I'm qualifying this. This is COVID-19 only in 2020. And we, we understand that COVID-19 is, is uh, going to have adverse effects in 2022 and 2023 and, and, and onward. So clearly um, a very dire, um, dire picture. Um, the last thing I want to point out is that COVID-19 somehow surprised most of us, um, almost all of us, I would say, um, including, um, you know, Asia was maybe better prepared for COVID-19 because it experienced SARS in 2003. Um, but even the countries in Asia that experienced SARS in 20, 2003 um, had the dramatic declines in economic activity and a lot of, of pain because of COVID-19. And in many other countries, of course, even countries we thought are very well prepared, they were very, very, very um, poorly prepared. And what worries me about that is not so much that we are not going to be prepared for COVID-19 or for a similar pandemic in the future. Um, we, we always seem to prepare for the last war. Uh, what worries me is that we are not prepared for the disasters we haven't really imagined um, yet, like was the case for pandemics in 2019 before this, this one hit us. Thanks very much, Ilan. Yeah, and, and a very telling picture there. Uh, yeah, I think I would be quite surprised if I saw either of those creatures in the ocean, but that's perhaps a different story. Um, I can see uh, the questions are starting to come in on my Q&A box here. Um, you talked very much, Ilan, about the, uh, the economic costs, the economic impacts um, of the pandemic. But of course, it's very much a human story, isn't it? Um, and, and I'd like to, I think, turn to Debbie. If I could just ask you, uh, one of these uh, questions from Suzette that's come in, actually. Um, it says, uh, she says, you know, the pandemic has had enormous costs, um, both directly uh, from the disease and indirectly from the containment policies around the globe. Um, how do you assess these human impacts, the human damage? Right, so my mic is now, I'm getting a lot of messages from you, I think, Karen. But um, um, I don't think so. You can ignore them all <laughs> and we can hear you loud and clear. So thanks very good. much. <laughs> good. So so you were asking about the the human impact. Right. Now, the COVID-19 COVID uh, pandemic, which was by far not the, the first and definitely not going to be the last. Um, uh, so uh, definitely not going to be the last has had two two, if you like, two packets, two, two buckets 
of impact. One is the impact of COVID-19 itself. And that has been from a health point of view, um, that has been both by cost of preventable deaths, so premature deaths, um, the deaths, most of the deaths, at least in Europe, and I, I think, I don't know what the, 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 the age sex distribution is in deaths in Asian countries, but a very large number of COVID-19 deaths are in very old people. They are the most susceptible groups. Um, but if you look at premature deaths, that's deaths among people who should not be dying at that age, that has been an important um, burden, an unmeasured burden on, on, the, on um, society and of, of, if you want to put a, a value to it, of the cost. The other kind of cost for COVID has been the cost of care. Now, cost of care for COVID is extremely high extremely high, um, mainly because the only, they, we don't have any real treatment options. They are coming in slowly uh, from Pfizer, um, um, among others. They are coming in slowly, but we don't have any treatment options in terms of non-invasive treatment. So most of the serious cases go into ICU and ventilations. Now, mechanical or non-mechanical ventilations cost a uh, package, really. I mean, it's a, it's a slap in your face. They are between six to 10,000 per patient per day. And per patient per day. So, you know, so you have any, any and that's only the ventilation. So the, the mechanical ventilation is about 10,000 um, US dollars per person per day. And the non-mechanical ones are a little less. Now, that's kind of money that it's very hard for almost anybody to bear in developed countries and you know, let alone in um, developing countries. The cost of ICU, the cost of ICU care, which a lot of people go into, even if you, they don't go into ventilation, they're going to ICU care. ICU care can be up to say 35,000 to 40,000, for say a three to five day period. These are huge amounts of money and this is cost of care, even if the patient survives. So even if the patient survives. So at the end, at the, at the disease itself is a huge economic burden. Now, um, I'd like to say something about the cost of non-COVID, um, of non-COVID altogether, everything else, and the cost of containment. And the cost of containment is a, is, has been very, very big, especially in poor countries in Africa and Asia, because it has led to the cancellation, which has been absolutely disastrous, cancellation of vaccination campaigns, of say vaccination of measles, which is one of the primary guaranteed killers of small children, of poor small children. And 37 countries, the vaccination campaigns have been canceled. So these are, this is, this has been, I mean, this is just an example. It just means that now we are sitting with cohorts of children who are not only not vaccinated, but in fact are very un unlikely to be vaccinated at all. Because to catch those, them back is going to be really, really hard to go back and catch these kids of nine months, which would be the optimal time is very hard. So I would say that, yes, I would say that those are those have really been the the containment costs for um, for the younger ages has been very 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 high. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Not to mention, of course, schooling, for example, or indeed the long term impacts of you know the the loss of a breadwinner or a breadwinner, the loss of uh, you know anything else that you you would have ordinarily done with the money you spent on healthcare, schooling, and so forth. Um, Thanks very much, Debbie. Yeah, all very, very pertinent. I'm sure we'll come back to some of those details as well. Uh, there's, I'd like to go back to the questions, though, um, because there's one that's very popular here, and it's about the number of disasters. And this is specifically uh, targeted to Charlie at you. It's, the question is, the number of disasters, especially those triggered by natural hazards, have been increasing in Asia and the Pacific. What are the underlying causes uh, for that? 
And how do you assess the region's risk management and disaster resilience efforts? Thank, thank you, Karen, and thank you very much for that question. First and foremost, thank you very much for the opportunity to join this illustrious panel. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and congratulations to Yasser San and his team on the, the excellent new report. Um, as we've already heard, indeed, the, the number of events is increasing, and linked to that, the number of people affected, the number of e economic losses is also rising. This partly, of course, reflects the impacts of climate change on the frequency and the intensity of extreme weather events. As, as Yasu San has mentioned, um, it's partly also due to demographic and economic growth, sometimes in extremely hazard-prone areas. Uh, most obviously in coastal areas, with insufficient regard to natural hazards in the design of buildings and other infrastructure and in their location. It also reflects um, growing regional and global connectivity through supply chains, through the movement of labor, meaning that an event in one country can have ramifications over a number of other countries. And we have examples of that playing out um, for instance, after the, the Thai flood some years ago, and of course the Great East um, Japan earthquake. Um, it is not easy to strengthen disaster resilience. Um, it's highly complex, it's cross-cutting, it requires systemic planning across pretty well all sectors of government um, and, and beyond a really multi-sector, um, multi-stakeholder event that brings in many different parties. Um, Yassisan has highlighted a number of the very significant remaining challenges and priorities remain. Uh, the question of course is though on, on progress today, and it's really important to acknowledge the progress that has been made because we are certainly not in the same situation we were 30, 40 years ago. Um, this partly reflects huge leaps in modeling capabilities and the related ability now to quantify disaster risk, including in monetary terms. And this has enabled um, people working on disaster risk management to, to capture the attention of ministries of finance, ministries of planning, move the agenda up from an area of concern, which was basically the purview of technical agencies, often quite marginalized technical agencies, into, into a much more central position um, that, that is, is discussed in, in important places at the heart of government. Um, Building on that, governments have, for instance, put in, um, in many countries in our region, um, much more holistic disaster risk management policies and strategies, moving beyond the traditional focus, which was very much on emergency preparedness and emergency response, and not really addressing efforts to enhance long-term resilience. We increasingly see development plans that incorporate disaster risk considerations right across the development plan, not just in one small chapter. There have been fast improvements in, in early warning systems, particularly for tropical cyclones, resulting um, in the saving of many, many lives. And um, in some cases now, governments also are paying much more attention to enhanced financial arrangements to respond as rapidly as possible when disasters occur. Um, so there has been a lot of progress. Um, I think challenges, if I recall correctly, that Yasu San mentioned that still remain on the table are, of course, that we're simply not spending enough money in this area. We need to do more. We need to plan more carefully, um, need to do more around insurance and risk transfer mechanisms more generally, better engagement of community. I mentioned national um, disaster risk management plans becoming more holistic. If we go down to the, the local level, the community level, they are often much more in the guise of emergency planning. Um, we need to build that better, of course, and embrace and draw on um, the considerable new technology and innovation that, that is available. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Yes, I mean, you mentioned a lot of progress, absolutely, a lot of work still to be done, and you mentioned uh, risk transfer uh, instruments are, are needed, which I think feeds uh, very nicely into the top question that we have in the Q&A box from Betty around uh, insurance. If I'm not mistaken, I think only about 8% 
of losses in Asia and the Pacific are actually insured, which means that, of course, the vast, vast majority are not. So the question is that I'd like to pose to Yasu is how can we help insure uh, directly the poorer households? Because, of course, governments uh, struggle to do that on a broader scope. Um, Yasu, maybe I can uh, pass that to you first. And Debbie, I don't know if you have any comments on that from a, a sort of a household point of view. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for asking this uh, very, very um, uh, important uh, uh, question. Uh, I, I think uh, I'm kind of echoing uh, what uh, Charlie already said. Um, uh, disaster uh, is um, uh, 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 generated by uh, 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 three elements, basically uh, uh, natural hazard and uh, exposure and vulnerability. So question is how to uh, strengthen uh, resilience of the poor uh, by uh, um, uh, reducing uh, risk of hazard. Th that's somewhat related to uh, climate change uh, uh, mitigation uh, related issues. And also uh, how to reduce exposures to the hazard and also uh, reduce uh, vulnerability and uh, uh, building up uh, resilience. And uh, one important point is uh, uh, shifting, uh, including um, uh, insurance or uh, financial uh, risk transfer mechanism. Uh, I think uh, shifting uh, resources and uh, mobilizing uh, uh, more uh, funding and other resources to um, uh, prevention uh, and strengthening uh, uh, disaster resilience through um, uh, mainstreaming uh, uh, disaster risk reduction and prevention uh, ex ante. So I think that's a very important. And also, um, uh, also again, uh, recapping uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, Charlie's uh, points, um, uh, taking uh, um, multi-layered uh, risk uh, 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 financing approach. So uh, big risk and the very rare risks uh, provide public uh, sector and the international assistance play very important role. And um, uh, more regular, smaller, frequent uh, risks. I think uh, even community or local government uh, can handle. And then middle area, I think uh, risk transfer, um, uh, designing and uh, also um, uh, 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 extending um, uh, risk transfer uh, insurance, uh, market-based insurance mechanisms. That, that's a very important. So I think how to um, um, mix this uh, different uh, risk area and different um, uh, uh, mechanisms to um, uh, reduce uh, 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 overall disaster risk. I think uh, that's um, uh, secondary, very important. And thirdly, uh, building uh, uh, better. So um, um, setting up uh, uh, overall institutional framework to secure speed, safety, inclusiveness, and uh, opportunity uh, for uh, uh, build better, build smarter. That's a very important. So these are a little bit abstract uh, uh, point set. I, I think uh, largely speaking, um, uh, in order to uh, help ensure directly poor household, I think the government can play uh, 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 um, uh, two elements, two uh, sides. Uh, first one is uh, reducing um, uh, 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 and uh, enhancing the uh, insurability of a poor family, poor individual by spending uh, uh, physical uh, infrastructure and um, uh, physically reducing uh, 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 exposure and vulnerability. And uh, secondly, I think from uh, non-physical parts, uh, institutionally supporting uh, um, um, uh, insurability of the poor people, providing a uh, soft protection. So one example, finally, I'd like to mention is Bangladesh. Bangladesh, uh, one big uh, uh, cyclone uh, hit Bangladesh, and then so many people are killed by, uh, used to be killed by uh, cyclone. But now on the hard side, uh, for example, uh, a cyclone shelter has been built in a cyclone pro area that really dramatically reduced uh, the uh, uh, human losses. At the same time, uh, early warning system, uh, uh, government uh, uh, wisely mobilized the uh, community uh, uh, based the uh, earning warning message conveyed to the uh, 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 individuals and families in rural area and poor uh, people. Uh, that also uh, function as a very effective uh, reduction of uh, overall uh, cyclone risks. So, so combining physical and uh, non-physical uh, intervention, government can do really change the um, uh, negative consequences of uh, uh, disasters uh, uh, affecting uh, directly poor household. So I think uh, 
this is my uh, response yeah. to you. Yeah, very important question. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Debbie, could I come to you on this? Because, um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. I mean, maybe you could speak to this um, issue of health insurance, perhaps crop insurance, income insurance, housing insurance. Um, I don't know. How do we get that out to the families? Right. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. First of all, before answering that, I'd like to take issue with Yasu. Um, and I don't know whether I have not understood. That's most likely the explanation because I haven't understood what he actually described. But to me, very briefly, the, at the end of his comment, I, it was not immediately clear to me that reducing exposure and reducing vulnerability to me is not a, on the face of it, an insurance inter intervention. Mm -hmm. This is this is a this is a standard public good. I don't know what you know what the economists call it a public good, uh, um, public sector um, intervention of the development kind. I mean, you know, better infrastructure, physical. So, so I don't see how it fits into insurance. To me, insurance is something that you you put in put in some resources or assets or money for future risk to 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 defray future risk. That, that to me is some form of interest. And to then, then come to Karen's, Karen's um, point, I, I'm, I'm really taken aback by um, Charlie's um, statistic on the 8% of the losses are, are insured. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really startled because, you know, I keep saying that without a number on it because we, you know, that, we was, that was my, that was my statistic, Debbie, actually. So, um, um, yeah. I believe I've read it somewhere. I'm very open to being corrected, but uh, by you, by Charlie or anybody else, but please go ahead. Yeah. No, it sounds to me very plausible. It's just that I've never heard a number put in it because we have in say global discussions where we work a lot with our Munich reinsurance colleagues and Aon Benfield and all of these big, we have never been able to get from them a, um, a refined, understanding, not even a number, but a refined understanding of the level of insurance penetration in the poorer countries of Asia. What is the insurance? We never got. So for me, this 8% was a real, it was a number that I could grab onto. In terms <laughs> okay. of households, um, you know, and I think we should get the insurance companies, sorry, just a parenthesis, we should get the insurance companies to make the effort to provide an estimation of the penetration, you know, really. But anyway, that's another, it's a different fight. But let's come down to the households. Um, I, what I wrote down here, you know, it's not going to be an easy hill to climb for sort of the lower, uh, lower income households in Asian countries, especially, especially, and Asia is particularly subject to that, the urban poor. This is a burgeoning population, the urban poor, and they live in very precarious conditions. To get those people worked into an insurance, um, insurance, even a publicly funded insurance, is not going to be easy. A good example is the Caribbeans. The Caribbeans have had very innovative models on community insurance, but one mustn't remember, must remember that the Caribbean countries are relatively rich, educated and rich. And so I think it's the household level participation in insurance is going to be a challenge. And I think it's a challenge that we have to face. We really have to uh, deal with how to, how to work these households in. Um, how can we make them co contribute to a joint up fund. Absolutely, absolutely. And I want to go to another question, but I perhaps Charlie wants to jump in. Do you have any figures? Uh, do, would you like to correct my 8% figure, for example? Um, absolutely, 8% sounds colossally high. I, I would agree with Debbie, it's really hard to find the, these numbers. Um, there are um, figures around on the percentage of insured losses relative to total losses, but, but even those treat Asia and the Pacific as a whole, which basically means the results include Japan, New Zealand, Australia, countries with much higher 
penetration. If we were able to strip those out and see how many, um, what percentage of insured losses, of total losses were insured in any one year in our developing member countries, I, I think it would be very, very low, probably well under 1% would be, would be my guess. But I absolutely agree. We, we need those numbers. We need to better understand this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Um, I can't remember where I read the number, but almost certainly would have probably ensure, uh, include, as you said, some of the, the developed countries. So really, perhaps not as pertinent as it should be for the, the discussion that we're having today. Um, Charlie, can I stay with you, actually? I wanted to ask you uh, this question in from Richard. The, the question is, what role do transparency and governance play in disaster risk reduction management in developing Asia, and perhaps some comments on the latest trends. Okay, thank you. Um, so obviously transparency and governance are, are really central um, and they go very much hand in hand. And I, I think the principles of that are, are, are very um, widely accepted. Um, Transparency possibly begins with transparency around actually knowing what the level of disaster risk is. Um, and therefore we know what we're trying to address the magnitude of the issue. And that transparency is not only for, for government, it's for individual businesses to, to um, know the levels of risk they face, the levels of risk they might create, um, and for individual households. Um, I mentioned earlier that there has been huge progress in disaster risk modeling, but you know, at the same time, for many of our developing member countries, um, that modeling information often sits in proprietary risk models. It sits in forms that aren't widely accessible. Most people don't actually have that information at their fingertips, even governments. So even governments, for instance, aren't able to take account of disaster risk when, when they do their fiscal risk assessments. So, so we really need to begin at, at that beginning point to, to really improve the information that then um, helps to explain and to justify the measures that are then put in place to, to reduce risk, to manage residual risk and um, to, to help others gauge whether those measures are indeed sufficient relative to the risk faced. Um, yeah, it is very difficult to comment on, on trends. Um, one, one small point perhaps to note is that there is increasing interest in, in budget tagging and in budget tracking of expenditure, both on, on climate, including climate change adaptation, and also around disaster risk management, um, trying to, to better understand how much is actually spent, um, and also enabling us to better understand that relative balance of expenditure on measures to reduce risk and to prepare, to, to prepare for events relative to expenditure in responding after the fact. Um, that the likelihood in most countries is that there is a significant skew uh, towards spending after the fact. Um, perhaps I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Um, we do have a whole lot of questions coming in. So thank you for your interest in this really, really critical topic. So I'm going to ask all of the panelists to be uh, very, very succinct in their upcoming answers, please, so that we can get to as many of these questions as we possibly can. And I'd like to go to Ilan next, please, if I could. Uh, there's a question about your slides, um, Ilan, uh, regarding the, uh, the graphic on lost lives being for all ages. Would the picture be any different if you looked at 60 years and below? Uh, the uh, RANA notes that many developing countries will not have significant proportion of their populations among the elderly as, co as compared to the OECD countries, of course. Could I ask you to speak to that very briefly? Yeah, very briefly, this, this accounts for that. So we're looking at the um, average age in each country um, <clears throat> and acknowledging that, and, and both for disaster, other disasters and for COVID-19, um, looking at the, the age at, at mortality and what is the life expectancy at the age of mortality for these to calculate the life years lost. So in, in a sense, we're, we're, we're completely um, accounting for that. That would be a short answer, I guess. Okay, perfect, perfect. <laughs> um, let me stick with you then on this, uh, this uh, second question from, from Bruce. Um, Bruce asks, how much uh, should developing Asian economies like 
the Philippines be spending to set aside in terms of investing in sustainable industries as well as disaster resilience, risk reduction measures and so forth. And he asked about the Philippines as a particular example. Any sense of how much should be spent on those sorts of things? So generally more than what we currently spend, that seems an obvious answer. And especially because most of the amount we spend and, and the ADB and other organizations have produced figures on that, most of the uh, amount we spend on disasters is in the emergency phase rather than in prevent prevention, resilience building and risk reduction. Um, so that's where we should be spending our money because you know, we know that uh, prevention is, is much more a worthy investment than, than exposed. Um, and that you know, relates to um, a whole host of things we can invest in, including governance and transparency as, as Charlie suggested in terms of providing information, providing information that is accessible and useful for say local government where they're doing their zoning um, um, decisions around where to build and where not to build, where to retreat from areas that are becoming um, too risky because of climate change and so on. So if you if you look comprehensively at all of these possible, basically you need to, as, as Charlie also said, you need to mainstream those decisions into every aspect of your investment, of your public investment. Um, so any kind of, of, of public investment should consider those things. So how do you exactly quantify how much of that, you know, you allocate into the, the disaster risk reduction bu bucket? That seems to be more of an accounting decision rather than, than a fundamental um, decision. But clearly we're not spending enough and we see that um, in a sense. I just wanna insert one more comment to straighten out the disagreement between Debbie and Yasu. Um, you, you need to reduce exposure and vulnerability so that disasters can be insurable. Uh, if disasters are frequent, they're not insurable. Uh, you can only insure for events that happen only say one in 30 years or one in 50 years. You cannot insure for events that happen frequently. Um, so you need to reduce exposure, reduce vulnerability. So these things become insurable. And be before that, they are not insurable. Thank, thanks very much. We like a good debate, of course. We like a good debate. Charlie, do you have anything to add on this, uh, this spending, GDP percentage spending? Yeah, th thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a really... Um, Important, actually quite a topical question. Um, the Philippines itself, um, local governments are required to set aside 5% of their annual budget into a local disaster risk reduction and management fund, some of which goes into a quick relief fund re ready for um, events that may occur, but some of it goes into what is referred to as a mitigation fund to be spent on um, disasters. Um, this, you know, um, the the thoughts have kind of gone backwards and forwards on whether you should or shouldn't have set asides. There, there is a line of thinking that we should be mainstreaming disaster resilience into everything and therefore you shouldn't need to have a, a separate um, set aside specifically to, to address it. But I, I think the trend is perhaps moving back the other way again and recognizing that actually perhaps you do, um, however it's, it's structured, whether it's a central um, pot that local governments, for instance, could access um, with some matching funding or, or in another way. Um, but, but if I may, uh, at the same time, you know, there was a, a study by ODI, the Overseas Development Institute, some years ago, looking at a few countries in Africa, where they basically took all those commitments that they would spend so much on health, so much on education, um, and all these other very pressing issues, and they simply added up countries' um, commitments to, to all these different sectors and not particularly surprisingly they came to more than 100 percent so you know these um these statements on percentages to be spent in a particular area i think need to be thought through very carefully it may not be percentage figures we're looking for as uh, as much as um maybe more of a focus on the mechanism to ensure that um the, the available funding is required. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, Charlie. Um, there is a sort of a related here from Maria Julia, actually, that I'd like to sort of posit at the same time. Um, she asks about what are the bottlenecks in dealing with uh, a, a poor decision-making process? Um, 
she talks about uh, perhaps that uh, disaster is a manifestation of development failures, but perhaps by governments, uh, perhaps speaking to, you know, better preparedness, better decision making, quicker decision making, and potentially uh, more money, I guess, being set aside earlier on. Would you like to comment on that, uh, Charlie? Um, yeah, very, very briefly. Um... A absolutely, um, we certainly can create disaster risk by failing to think about that risk um, in development. You know, an obvious one being, for instance, um, put putting in a road across um, which upsets in turns in, in turn sort of flow of water across an area of land and creating a, a sort of physical barrier that. Um, leads to water building up on one side. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think that is a, a well-recognised sort of argument um, and, and leads, of course, into then that need to mainstream disaster risk considerations into, into all relevant development actions. We need to be thinking about disaster risk um, every step of the way. I'll stop there in the interest of time. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, Debbie, I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that. I mean, is this something uh, we should be thinking about at the local level, potentially, as well as the national level? Um, you know, I, I don't think I have any pity words of wisdom on this. Um, I, I think uh, Charlie has, has said very succinctly what, but I would like to come back, Karen. I think um, Ilan is, uh, is wanting to say something about this. I would like to come back about gaps in data um, at some point before we end, if possible. So I'll make a little comment on that later on. Thank you. Why don't, you, why don't you stick with that? Because we do have a question about gaps in data, and then I'll come very briefly, very quickly back to Ilan, if, if I may. Uh, there's a question about, uh, I'd like to ask about the gap on data collection and maintenance between countries and rural versus urban areas. The question already goes like two steps ahead of where we are now. And I think those questions can't be answered unless we answer some questions upstream. Now, I was looking at the bias in MDAT data, which is used very widely. And I think, you know, some of the people on this on this panel use it, MDAT data. I was looking at the bias. Now, to be quite frank, we don't have a clue as to what the bias is. We don't have a clue. And I think if we don't have a clue as to what the bias is, this is a very serious weakness in the data set and to make decisions based on that and to say the trend is this and the trend is that is ex building on extremely slippery ground. So what would be my, so, so that's where we are with the global database. And there's a lot of missing data and so on and so forth. So what would be my take on that for data gaps and, and looking into more detail. I mean, the lady or the gentleman wanted urban, rural and things. That's even, that's really even more downstream. What would be, I think the, the first vision would be to really bring the disaster data loss issue down to a much higher resolution. So that, that's to say that bring it down to the regional level where the data is much closer to the ground and can be much more detailed than anything we can do at the global level. The Munich reinsurance data, for example, is collected by insurance, the insurance companies in the countries. And so they are very confident of the data. We are not. And so somewhere the regions have to take up their responsibility and say that if we want to do disaster resilience or preparedness response or whatever, anything, we need to have data on a regional level. I wouldn't even say national level, but at the regional level. And, and there is a reason why I'm saying that, but I won't keep you any longer. Thank you. Yeah, the numbers are at the basis of everything. Um, Ilan, I'm sure you would agree with that, but you had some comments to make. Yeah, maybe two comments. <clears throat> One was on the previous question and, and the implied uh, comment that uh, disasters are an issue of development and that once you develop, then disaster risk resolves itself. And, and I, I strongly disagree with that because if we think across countries, for example, with COVID-19, we've seen some fairly low income countries deal with this crisis much better than some very high income countries. 
Um, and that that is not only true for COVID-19. So we've seen for COVID-19, we've seen, for example, Vietnam being very successful in dealing with the, uh, with the crisis. Uh, but even for typhoon risk, um, some, some countries are much better than others. And, and that success is not that closely correlated with, um, with income. So Cuba is, is incredibly successful in dealing with, with hurricane risk. Uh, for, I know it's not in Asia, but still it's a country. Um, and so we don't, we shouldn't think about disasters as an issue of development because then that leads us to the perception that we shouldn't worry about disasters. We should worry about development and the, and, and the disaster issue will, will resolve itself. So I, I, I do not think that's the case. And I think poor countries can do a lot. And Yasu talked about the example of Bangladesh, uh, how Bangladesh already back in the seventies and eighties when it was a very poor country, um, dealt with the um, with the early warning system um, problem and, and dealt with it very successfully. So that's one comment. The other comment is about data. Uh, we now have, um, you know, we live in an era in which data is all around us um, all the time, and we need to think creatively about using other sources of data to 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 actually measure these these risks and these costs and so on. So, like the costs that MDAT. Um, for example, uh, measures. And actually the Asian Development Bank has a project right now, if I may, as an outsider, actually um, flag that. Uh, the Asian Development Bank has a, has, has a project that looks at big data and the, and the role of big data in, um, in disaster um, risk reduction um, using things like uh, remote sensing data, uh, nightlight satellite data, and, and, and maybe mobile phone data and so on. So, you know, there's a lot of other data sources that we can use uh, and we can creatively um, use them um, to fill out these gaps that, that both Debbie and Charlie um, have um, clearly outlined, just, just the outline. Absolutely, absolutely. We need to be thinking very, very creatively about our data collection. Well, I'll perhaps toss that very quickly to Yasu, if I may, because I know that he has been working on some of those areas. Uh, and also to ask perhaps simultaneously two questions from Dipanka and uh, AA, love the name. Um, the first question is about the impact of disasters uh, being very varied on areas like fr from trade and tourism uh, experts. Um, how do we mention, uh, how do we measure the long-term impacts on institutional mechanisms like health facilities, schools, and teachers? And AA asks, how, do you, how can you measure the cost of loss of time of education for students, family member time for nursing care, including loss of specialists, for example? So data is critical. And as uh, Iran said, we are uh, living in the era of big data. So new innovative data, real time, high frequency data can be used. And uh, one comment uh, related to what uh, Debbie mentioned about uh, uh, insurance. And uh, now, uh, for example, in last one decade already in uh, East Africa, um, uh, index based uh, uh, livestock insurance and the index is um, uh, satellite imagery, daylight satellite imagery and vegetation index. So this kind of uh, innovative insurance product can be uh, experimented and piloted and then scaled up. I think that's very important. And overall, I think uh, uh, market failure uh, in uh, insuring people is a big challenge. Uh, as a hardware economist, uh, how to solve this market failure, I think this should be placed uh, uh, in the center of uh, resilience uh, research program policy making. And um, uh, finally, uh, related to a uh, nine uh, percent number uh, mentioned by Karen, actually that uh, number uh, came from uh, one of the other uh, publications we put out together with uh, OECD, uh, ADB OECD report on uh, 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 leveraging uh, technology, technology innovation for disaster risk management. Uh, we released uh, earlier uh, this year uh, together with OECD for APEC finance minister process, and uh, nine percent based on the. Um, uh, reinsurance company, Munich Re and uh, 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 Swiss Re is uh, 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 chair of economic losses insured by, um, uh, covered by insurance. And 9% uh, is number for um, uh, middle income uh, economies and countries of uh, region. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, I'm afraid that we are at the top of the hour, so we're almost out of time. We did not get to as many questions as we wanted to, and I apologize to those of you who had questions that we didn't manage to respond to at this time. It's a big topic. Uh, it's a topic at the front of everyone's minds. Um, I'm sure we will be coming back to it at some point. 
Um, as Yasu said uh, at the beginning of the webinar, uh, the report, the uh, supplement report that you mentioned is on the website. The webinar will be on the website. The presentation will be on the website. And as I said, I'm sure we'll come back to this topic at some point. So that leaves me to thank all of you, the participants, for engaging with us so actively on this very important topic. Uh, thank you also to Debbie, to Ilan. Uh, now more than ever, we need your expertise, of course, and uh, from ADB to both Charlie and to Yasu. Um, and just before we go, let me tell you about our upcoming Asian Impact webinar. This, will, this is entitled Recent Financial Conditions in Emerging East Asia and Real-Time Macroeconomic Monitoring. So please join us for that. That is on the 14th of July at 10 a.m. Manila, Singapore, Hong Kong time, and we'll have more experts to discuss how we can assess future financial markets and financial conditions, and a new tool called Tracking Asia to help us do just that. So please join us then. Thank you and have a good rest of the day.